Welcome to A Look Ahead. We're delighted you've decided to join us. We study the Sabbath School lessons as prepared by the Seventh-day Adventist Church. And this particular series, we're at the last lesson in that series, is entitled, In the Crucible with Christ. And you might be able to guess what that lesson's about because it's entitled, Christ in the Crucible. Now, what point in his life would be Christ in the Crucible? Well, you can think about that while we pray as we begin. Our kind and wonderful Father, the sacrifice that you made in sending your son and all that he went through, especially in that final week here on this earth is just incomprehensible to us as ordinary human beings. Be with us as we study that together and try to understand more clearly why you did it and what it means to us. May that be our goal in our discussion today as our prayer in Jesus' name, amen. amen. If we believe that God can see the future, and I firm, fervently believe that, and knows the end from the beginning, we need to realize that when Adam and Eve sinned, God already knew what would happen when he came to this earth. Um, was it worth the risk? Love, the very foundation of God's government, is impossible without freedom. See our handout, and I would encourage you to do this if you possibly can. Uh, our handout there is found at our, on our website, theox.org. If you go to general topics and look for love, it will explain why love is not possible without complete freedom. So our freedom was so important to God that he was willing to die for it. Think about that. He was willing to die for our freedom. Jesus as a human being twice died. Did you realize that? He first died in the Garden of Gethsemane, then he died on Calvary because of separation from his father, the only source of life. The universe watched on both occasions as the father withdrew his beams of light and love from Jesus to demonstrate the full and complete results of sin. In the Garden of Gethsemane, an angel was sent to resuscitate Jesus when he fell dying to the ground. So in order to get that full picture, you need to put several passages from the Bible and some comments from Ellen White together. So let's see if we can do that. Jim? From the beginning of Ellen White, excuse me, from the writings of Ellen White, Having made the decision, he, that is Jesus, fell dying to the ground from which he had partially risen. There now were his disciples to place their hands tenderly beneath the head of their fainting master and bathe that brow, marred indeed more than the sons of men. The Savior trod the winepress alone, and of the people there was none with him. But God suffered with his son. Angels beheld the Savior's agony. They saw their, Lord's, their Lord enclosed by legions of satanic forces. Um, let me interrupt for a second. As, Jesus, as Christ is making this pivotal decision in the Garden of Gethsemane, whether he's going to go through with this, how many beings in the rest of the universe were interested in what was going on there? Everyone except those on this earth. <laughs> Everyone except us, everyone except us, just amazing. And our three representatives who were invited to come and participate, what were they doing? Sleeping. Sleeping. Okay, go ahead. His nature weighed down with a shuddering, mysterious dread. There was silence in heaven, no harp was touched. Could mortals have viewed the, amaz the amazement of the angelic host as in silence grief they watched the Father separating his beams of light, love, and glory from his beloved Son. They would better understand how offensive to his sight is sin. Ellen White, Desire of Ages, page 693. Wow. God separating his beams of light, love, and glory from his beloved Son. What an incredible situation. It is commonly believed by millions of Christians that Christ came to this world solely to pay the price for sin, our sins. There is much more to what Christ did. Let's see if we can discover some of those issues. God hates sin because of what it, he knows it does to his children. 
So he chose to make this ultimate demonstration of the results of sin to teach us all how serious sin is. <clears throat> Early in the history of Christianity, it was believed there was a thing called the ransom theory that Satan was a kind of vandal who managed to take control of humans by getting Adam and Eve to agree to his lies in the Garden of Eden. Thus, he took them as hostages into his kingdom. People's thought was that in response, God decided to negotiate with the devil. This was their idea in those days to get humans back again. God offered to give the devil the soul of his son, Jesus Christ, as a ransom in exchange for the souls of all humans. The devil, was, the devil has wanted most of all to take the place of Jesus Christ, and so he accepted God's offer. But what Satan did not realize was that he could not keep control of Jesus Christ. Jesus escaped from him. In effect, according to this anciently believed ransom theory, God won the great controversy by tricking the devil. How does that sound? <laughs> well, it was believed by a lot of people at one point in time. That theory was fairly popular in the days when groups like the Vandals from North Africa would suddenly attack a city and take whatever they could grab, including the sons of wealthy people, and demand a high ransom price for those, from those people to get their sons back. So you could see how that would sort of influence people's thinking. From his birth, Jesus lived in poverty and risked the possibility of being destroyed or killed. The devil would have done anything God allowed, of course, you know, here's, here's a question of what will God allow to get uh, rid of Jesus Christ? Luke 2, 7 and 22 through 24, reflecting what it says in Leviticus 12, 6 to 8, in terms of uh, dedicating the child, and Matthew 2, 1 to 18 are familiar passages, tell us very clearly that Jesus was born into a poor family. Herod, the leader of the Jewish nation at the time, tried to kill him while he was still an infant. We know those stories. Jesus could have chosen, yeah. what? You asked at the beginning, when was Christ in the crucible? And you said it was the, especially the last week. It was his whole life. His whole life. The whole yeah. life from, from the time of his birth onward. I mean, Herod was seeking to find him to kill him uh, at his birth. We believe that each one of us has a guardian angel. Jesus required two. God says, I'm not going to allow Satan to go one step beyond the, what I allow. I, whatever I allow, fine. Not one step further. You, that's what you can do. Well, Nazareth, uh, he lived with a poor family in Nazareth, which had such a bad reputation that it was despised by the people who lived around it. You can read that in John 1, 46. With the exception of Adam and Eve before the fall, Jesus was and is the only person who has lived a sinless life on this earth. Try to imagine how he felt in his sinless purity as he watched even his own family members commit sins and do evil. There was a professor in an Adventist college. Uh, he was the dean of student affairs. And in the Savasu class, he was arguing, Jesus must have committed sins before he was 12 years old. And I said, no, that's not possible. <laughs> it is impossible. What kind of, uh, what kind of um, picture do we have yeah. of our Heavenly Father and of Jesus Christ? It's important. Yeah. Okay, well, what's, what's a sin and what's not a sin, you know, when you're a three-year-old? Yeah. Well, I mean, that's, okay, the God's going to make a fair decision about that. I'm sure there were times when Jesus cried uh, and that kind of stuff, if you, but that's not a sin. Yeah. Even losing it on an airplane is not a sin. <laughs> <laughs> well, I don't think you had that problem. <laughs> Gary? Every sin, every discord, every defiling lust that transgression had brought was torture to his spirit. And that's from Alan G. White, Desire of Ages, page 111, paragraph 4. So imagine living in the despised city of Nazareth, and every time he saw something like that, it just was torture to his soul. Okay? Jesus was placed where his character would be tested. It was necessary for him to be constantly on guard in order to preserve his purity. 
he was subject to all the conflicts which we have to meet, that he might be an example to us in childhood, youth, and manhood. Satan was unwearied in his efforts to overcome the child of Nazareth. From his earliest years, Jesus was guarded by heavenly angels, yet his life was one long struggle against the powers of darkness. That there should be upon the earth one life free from the defilement, defilement rather, of evil was an offense and a perplexity to the prince of darkness. Let me interrupt for a second. Just can you imagine that? Satan, you know, he's had absolute control of every person who's lived, and here's one person. Can you imagine what Satan and his, all, all his forces, they must have had a conference every morning, okay, how are we going to get Jesus? How are we going to get Jesus? How are we going to get Jesus? Okay, go ahead. He left no means <coughs> untried to ensnare Jesus. No child of humanity will ever be called to live a holy life amid so fierce a conflict with temptation as was our Savior. And that again was Ellen White, Desire of Ages. Gordon, you want to take the next one there? <clears throat> this, <clears throat> this also is from Desire of Ages. Jesus worked to relieve every case of suffering that he saw. He had little money to give, but he often denied himself of food in order to relieve those who appeared more needy than he. His brothers felt that his influence went far to counteract theirs. Right. <laughs> yeah, and uh, I assume that his was not on the bad side, that no. Jesus was on the good side and the brothers were on the bad side. Yeah. <clears throat> he possessed a tact which none of them had or desired to have. When they spoke harshly to poor degraded beings, Jesus sought out these very ones and spoke to them words of encouragement. To those who were in need, he would give a cup of cold water and would quietly place his own meal in their hands. Wow. <clears throat> As he relieved their sufferings, the truths he taught were associated with his acts of mercy and were thus riveted in the memory. It's amazing when you read something like that. Then you realize that a little while later, he comes back to Nazareth to give a sermon on, in, 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 the, in the, the synagogue. And what? He said some things they didn't like. They wanted to kill him. Amazing. How fast the opinions change. Yeah. Okay. Go ahead, Herb. Dwayne. Yet through childhood, youth, and manhood, Jesus walked alone. In his purity and his faithfulness, he trod the winepress alone, and of the people there was none with him. He carried the awful weight of responsibility for the salvation of men. He knew that unless there was a decided change in the principles and purposes of the human race, all would be lost. This was the burden of his soul, and none could appreciate the weight that rested upon him. Filled with the intense purpose, he carried out the design of his life that he himself should be the light of men. Wow, desire of ages again. I mean, when you talk about Jesus and what he did in childhood or what he did later and especially that last week of his life, there is no other place you can go to that even comes close to Desire of Ages for understanding the details. How do we feel and how do we respond when we observe sin taking place around us? Do we laugh? Do we just ignore it? Is it possible for us to avoid exposure to sin? How can we minimize our exposure to sin? depart to some wooded place and live as a hermit. Throughout his life, Jesus was misunderstood, misinterpreted, and despised. The religious leaders in his day were relentless in their attempts to discredit him or even to arrest him and kill him. Matthew 12, 22 to 24. Then some people brought to Jesus man who was blind and could not talk because he had a demon. Jesus healed the man so that he was able to talk and see. The crowds were all amazed at what Jesus had done. Could he be the son of David, they asked. When the Pharisees... What did they mean by the son of David? Could he be the promised Messiah? Exactly. That's what they had in mind, yes. yes. Go ahead. 
When the Pharisees heard this, they replied, He drives out demons only because he has the ruler uh, Beelzebul, gives him power to do so. American Bible yeah. Society, the Holy Wow. Bible. What do, they th what do you think the people thought when they heard that the Pharisees claiming that Jesus drove out demons by the power of other demons? I mean, here was a person from their community. They knew about his condition. And Jesus heals the man. Blindness and, you know, dumbness, whatever. And then, the, oh, well, that's, he does that because he has the power of the demons. I just, I just wonder what medical condition it is that causes someone to not see and not talk. Yeah, exactly. Other than enzyme deficiencies, I don't know what it is. Or was it two different complete conditions that happened to be in the same person? Possibly. Well, when he went back to preach in his hometown synagogue, Jesus referred to his own healing of the Syrian leper. You remember that story, Naaman. And Elijah being sent to Zarephath and the territory of Sidon. And then the people, when they heard him referring to these Old Testament experiences, when God reached out to people who are not Jews, became so angry that they wanted to kill him. <laughs> I mean, can you imagine it? When Jesus relieved uh, and forgave the sins of the woman taken in adultery and then faced off with the Sanhedrin, he made several bold statements claiming in fact that he was God. Now if you know exactly the wording there and you understand it, three times in that discussion with them, he said basically, I am, I am. And finally he says, you guys don't get it, do you? So then he said in John 8, 58 and 59, I am telling you the truth, Jesus replied, before Abraham was born, I am. And they, they couldn't miss it. Then they picked up stones to throw at him. But Jesus hid himself and left the temple. I mean, this is just almost from the beginning of his ministry, when Jesus cleansed the temple for the first time, the Jewish religious leaders wanted to kill him. Jim? Ellen White, in these words, his meaning was twofold. He referred not only to the destruction of the Jewish temple and worship, but to his own death. This is, of course, the top about, you know, destroy this temple and I will rebuild it in three days. The destruction of the temple of his body. This, excuse me, this was Jews. This the Jews. This the Jews were already plotting at the priests and rulers returned to the temple. They had proposed to kill Jesus and thus to rid themselves of the troubler. Ellen White, Desire of Ages, page 164. This was approximately six months into his ministry, and they're already trying to, wanting to kill him. But referring to the, same, to the time during that, same, that final week of his life on this earth, we read Matthew 23, 37. Carrie? Jesus said, Jerusalem, Jerusalem, you kill the prophets and stone the messages, messengers God has sent you. How many times have I wanted to put my arms around all your people, just as a hen gathers her chicks under her wings, but you would not let me? That's from the Good News Bible. So what do you think would cause Jesus to make a statement like that? Was he feeling bad for himself because of what he knew was coming? Or was he truly sorrowful for the consequences it would have on those to whom he was speaking? Again, from Ellen White. Pardon? It was because of his innocence that he, that is Christ, felt so keenly the assaults of Satan. Selected Messages, Book 3, page 129. Well, what should we learn from his example? Satan is alive and well. He did everything he could to destroy Jesus, but he failed. If we are striving to be like Jesus, what should we expect from Satan? He knows that he only has a short time, 1 Peter 5, 8 and Revelation 12, 12. I mean, the only chance Satan has to extend his life is to get us to sin, to get us to fail to prepare uh, for the second coming. The story of what happened to Jesus in the Garden of Gethsemane and then later on Calvary 
is beyond human comprehension. Let's take a careful look at some of those issues. We do not know how Jesus as a human being learned about his role in the universe before he came and was born here. Ellen White says the Father himself at times instructed Jesus as a child. She also says that the angels instructed him. So I'm assuming that they were the ones who taught him about what he did and the experiences, whatever, before he came to this earth as a child. Uh, Ephesians 1, 4, well, several places here are going to talk about how much he knew before uh, his experience here on this earth. Duane? Ephesians 1, 1 through 4. From Paul, who by God's will as an apostle of Christ Jesus, to God's people in Ephesus, who are faithful in their life in union with Christ Jesus. May God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ give you grace and peace. Let us give thanks to the, the, to the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. For in our union with Christ, he, was blessed, he has blessed us by giving us every spiritual blessing in the heavenly world. Even before the world was made, God had already chosen us to be his through our union with Christ so that we would be holy and without fault before him because of his love. Wow. So before the creation of this world, God knew all this was going to go on. Okay. Do you want to do the next one as well? Uh, 2 Timothy 1, 8 and 9. Do not be ashamed then of witnessing for our Lord, nor be ashamed of me, a prisoner for Christ's sake. Instead, take your part in suffering for the good news, as God gives, us, gives you the strength to do it. He saved us and called us to be his own people, not because of what we have done, but because of his own purpose and grace. He gave us this grace by means of Christ Jesus before the beginning of time. Okay, well, how, how, do you, how do you understand that last sentence? We weren't there before the beginning of time. What would that mean? It has to mean that God had it all planned out. Yeah. And that it was all planned out before, before this earth was created. There's one more verse. Was all the evil planned out too? Well, that's a good question. And we're going we're gonna to see something about that a little bit later. So um, I, I have to believe that God saw this whole thing. He, it, and we know that the, at, at the third coming, there's going to be that massive panorama in 3D living color, and it's going to show all the details. Uh, of course, by that time, it will have been over. But Ellen White then goes on to say, this study of the plan of salvation will be an eternal safeguard. We'll, we'll, we'll see that as we move on. Yeah. Well, when I read that, I, I think, I, uh, it's just a, a thought that I get. Was was this the plan for Christ Jesus? I mean, God looking forward, knowing what was going to happen. Yeah, he wasn't well, caught by surprise. And well, if 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 you don't limit God's foreknowledge, and what finite ber person is in a position to do so? Yeah, is that logical? Yeah. So uh, if he, he, he knew it up, because no, if people, if intel, intelligent creatures, the ones before this Earth's creation, those lived, we talk about the, the ones that uh, Satan drugged down with his, uh, with his tail of the dragon there, um, they all had to learn. And we, our understanding with uh, Colossians 1, 19 and 20, and Ephesians 1, 9 and 10, and 3, 9 and 10, and John 12, 32, and what? 1 Corinthians 4, 9, and so, so forth. It wasn't until Jesus' death that the others, the other heavenly intelligences, finally understood. We're still learning and, and adding. That's my understanding, anyway. But, but this particular verse makes me think that God foresaw a need well, for yeah. a personal representative yeah, in, that's, in the future for a, for a purpose. Yeah, that's why, we, that's, what we, that's why we started out with that question, was it worth it? 
was it worth it? And God said, freedom is absolutely essential for love. And love is the basis of my government. So I am not going to, I'm not willing to limit my freedom, anybody's freedom at all. So God said, and, and my explanation is this, let's, I believe that God has stopped creating new worlds and new beings during this emergency because if he created a new world with a new group of people immediately you know who would demand to have access to them so i don't think god is creating any new beings any free beings during this emergency of our here on this earth when it's over i think he's probably going to start creating again and I, th just this theoretically let's talk hypothetically let's say <clears throat> a billion years from now someone on one of those new worlds decides to rebel against satan I mean, against God's way. So why do we have to do it his way? Why can't I do it my way? And God would say, sit down right here. I have something I want to show you. And he will show him, the, uh, this he would, if hypothetically, the story of this world and what happened here. If after watching that, he still wants to rebel against God, see the co terrible consequences that happened here on this earth, if he still wants to, to, to rebel against God, I think God would just in, invite all of us who lived through this earth's experience, who were in heaven at that time, and say, what do you think I should do for this person who wants to start the great controversy all over again? And we would say, just step back from him, leave him alone, let him perish. I, it's going to be an eternal safeguard. The history of this world has to happen once, but never again. What reasonable person could be persuaded to listen to any kind of a well rebellious? Who, who would come up with it? Think of the Lucifer, story, the Lucifer story, standing next to the throne of God. Just there's nothing about it that makes any sense. In, well, in Dachau and some of the other prison camps that Hitler and, and his cronies ran, they now have a memorial that says never again mm -hmm. but it's happening again yeah it's happening again to other people but you also got the deceiver has been i hate to use the term he's alive but he's not well but he's very active and the deception is you know, mix in truth with error it isn't bald-faced lies it's truth and error all mixed together and who's got the microphone we don't have a very big microphone but the, uh, the uh, other entities yeah. have, have a big microphone and they, they work uh, let's, <laughs> let's, let's, Yeah, Let's look now at his experience in the Garden of Gethsemane. What do we know about the actual experience of Jesus in the Garden of Gethsemane? Let's see, I guess, Charles, that's yours? Matthew 26. Matthew 26, 39. He went a little farther on through himself face downwards on the ground and prayed, My Father, if it is possible, take this cup of suffering from me, yet not what I want, but what you want. Good news Bible. Mark fourteen thirty three to 36 He took Peter, James, and John with him. Distress and anguish came over him, and he said to them, the sorrow in my heart is so great that it is almost crushes me. Stay here and keep watch. He went a little farther on, threw himself on the ground, and prayed that if possible, he might not have to go through this time of suffering. Father, he prayed, my father, all things are possible for you. Take this cup of suffering away from me, yet not what I want, but what you want. Goodness Bible. Okay, then I'll, I'll pick it up there. Luke 24, I'm sorry, 22, 41 to 44. Then he went off from them about the distance of a stone's throw and knelt down and prayed. Father, he said, if you will, take this cup of suffering away from me. Not my will, however, but your will be done. An angel from heaven appeared to him and strengthened him. In great anguish, he prayed even more fervently. His sweat was like drops of blood falling to the ground. Some manuscripts don't have those last two verses. And 
Um, I think that's because to people who are just thinking about this, think, how could that really be possible? Is it really possible that such a thing could happen? Okay, Jim? Right. From Ellen White, he went a little distance from them, not so far but that they could both see and hear him, and fell prostrate upon the ground. He felt that by sin <coughs> he was being separated from his father. The gulf was so broad, so black, so deep, that his spirit shuddered before it. This agony he must not exert this agony, he must not exert his divine power to escape. As man he must suffer the consequences of man's sin. As man he must endure the wrath of God against the oppressor. Note that the wrath of God does. Christ was now standing in a different attitude from that in which he had ever stood before. His suffering can best be described in the words of the prophet, Awake, O sword, against my shepherd, and against the man that is my fe fellow, saith the Lord of hosts, Zechariah 13, 7. At the substitute and surety, excuse me, as the substitute and surety for sinful man, Christ was suffering under divine justice. He saw that justice meant hitherto he had been as an intercessor for others. Now he longed to have an intercessor for himself. Ellen White, Desire of Ages 686. Ellen White, again, he has left the courts of heaven where all his pure, with where all is purity, happiness, and glory to save the one lost sheep, the one world that has fallen by transgression, and he has not turned from his mission. He, will, me, not he will not turn from his mission. He will become the propitiation of a grace that his will to sin. His prayer now breathes only submission. If this cup may not pass away from me, except I drink it, thy will be done. Having made the decision, he fell dying to the ground. Okay, let's open. That. Let's notice that once again here. He fell dying to the ground, and then little, little. We read already up above, and we're going to read it again. Someone came to strengthen him. Let's think about the implications of that. Go ahead. He had fell dying to the ground from which he had partially risen. Jesus would have died right there in the Garden of Gethsemane if that angel had not come to strengthen him. The entire universe, except for us on this earth, saw this, saw oh, that that sin happened. causing separation from God leads to death. Where now were his disciples to place their hands tenderly beneath the head of their fainting master and bathe that brow, marred indeed by more than the sons of men, the Savior trod the winepress alone and as, excuse me, as of the, excuse me, and of the people, there was none with him. But God suffered with his son. Angels beheld the Savior's agony. They saw their Lord and closed by legions of satanic forces. His nature weighed down and with shuddering mysterious dread. There was silence in heaven. No harp was touched. Could mortals have viewed the amazement of the angelic host as in silent br grief they watched the Father separating his beams of light, love, and glory from his beloved Son? They would, they would better understand his, how offensive in his sight is sin. The worlds unfallen and the heavenly angels had watched the, with intense interest as the conflict drew to its close. So what was, let me interrupt there for a second. So we've got the forces, all of Satan's forces on one side and all of God's forces on the other side trying to, in conflict right here in the Garden of Gethsemane. Go ahead. The angels had watched with intense interest as the conflict drew to its close. Satan and his confederacy of evil, the legions of apostasy, watched intensely this great crisis in the work of the redemption. The powers of good and evil waited to see what answer would come to Christ's thrice repeated prayer. Angels had longed to bring relief to the divine sufferer, but this might not be. No way of escape was found for the Son of God. In this awful crisis, when everything was at stake, 
When the mysterious cup trembled in the hand of the sufferer, the heavens opened, a light shone forth amid the stormy darkness of the crisis hour. And the mighty angels, excuse me, and the mighty angel who stands in God's presence, occupying the position from which Satan fell, came to the side of Christ. Wow. The, the angel came not to take the cup from Christ's hands, but to strengthen him to drink it. With the assurance of God of the Father's love, he came to give power to the divine human suppliant. He pointed him to the open heavens, telling him of the souls that would be saved as a result of his suffering. He assured him that his Father is greater and more powerful than, sa than Satan, that his death would result in the utter discomfiture of Satan, and the kingdom of this world would be given to the states of the Most High. He told him that he would see the travail of his soul and be satisfied, for he would see the multitude of the human race saved, eternally saved. Ellen White, Desire of Ages, page wow. 690 to page 693. Yeah, I wonder, well, she suggests that, they, that, that the three disciples saw some of the light or something, they didn't know exactly what, but here is, I mean, the entire great controversy is hanging in the balance here. God had warned us as human beings through Adam and Eve's experience in the Garden of Eden that sin would lead to death in Genesis 2.17. But no one up to that point in time had ever died. Of course, back in the Garden of Gethsemane, Garden of Eden, I'm sorry. How did God try to explain the seriousness of his warning to Adam and Eve? God understood that the only way he would be able to make clear how serious sin was would be to come himself and to die what we call the second death, which is a re direct result of sin. Carrie? Upon Christ as our substitute and surety was laid the iniquity of us all. He was counted a transgressor that he might redeem us from the condemnation of the law. The guilt of every descendant of Adam was pressing upon his heart. The wrath of God against sin, the terrible manifestation of his displeasure because of iniquity, filled the soul of his son with consternation. All of his life Christ had been publishing to a fallen world the good news of the Father's mercy and pardoning love. Salvation for the chief of sinners was his theme. But now, with the terrible weight of guilt he bears, he cannot see the Father's reconciling face, the withdrawal of the divine countenance from the Savior in this, hour, yes, in this hour of supreme anguish, pierced his heart with a sorrow that can never be fully understood by man. So great was this agony that his physical pain was hardly felt. I'm going to interrupt there for a moment. We're going to focus on that last sentence. Jesus was so distressed by the fact that he, he, he couldn't feel his, his connection with his father that all those bleeding stripes on his back, all those, the crown of thorns on his head, the blood dripping in his eyes. Think about that. And you can't wipe your eyes. Your, his, his, his hands are out there, you know. Well, you know, this later on, and this is talking about Calvary now. I mean, just imagine that whole scenario. And what was worrying him most of all? Not any of that, but the fact that he, he couldn't feel, the, because of the separation caused by sin, he couldn't feel the presence of his father. It started in Gethsemane, it looks yeah. like. Yeah. Uh, it happened it twice. <sighs> He went through it in Gethsemane, and then he went through it later at Calvary. Okay, Satan, go ahead. Satan, with his fierce temptations, wrung the heart of Jesus. The Savior could not see through the portals of the tomb. Hope did not present to him his coming forth from the grave, a conqueror, or tell him of the Father's acceptance of the sacrifice. He feared that sin was so offensive to God that their separation was to be eternal. So that's what he was worried about. Yeah. He sees sin coming between himself and his father, and he realizes, he thinks, sin is so offensive to God, could this be an eternal separation from my father? Yeah. Christ felt the anguish 
which the sinner will feel when mercy shall no longer plead for the guilty race. Mm. It was the sense of sin bringing the Father's wrath upon him as man's substitute that made the cup he drank so bitter and broke the heart of the Son of God. That's from Mrs. Ellen G. White, Zara of Ages, page 7531-2. Wow. So, I mean, Jesus there is going through the experience that the wicked will go through at the third coming, that final time of judgment, just before they perish eternally. Isaiah 59, verse 2, it is because of your sins that he doesn't hear you. It is your sins that separate you from the God, from God when you try to worship him. Okay? And then from the Bible study guide, death by crucifixion was one of the harshest punishments the Romans meted out to anyone. It was considered the worst way to die. Thus, how horrific for anyone to be killed that way, in particular, the Son of God. Jesus, we must always remember, came in human flesh like ours. Between the beatings, the scourgings, the nails hammered into his hands and feet, and the harrowing weight of his own body tearing at the wounds, the physical pain must have been unbearable. This was harsh even for the worst of criminals. How unfair then that Jesus, innocent of everything, should face such a fate. Wow. And yet, we just read Ellen White saying just the opposite. Not just the opposite, but... Well, saying that, that his fear of separation from his father was beyond all of that. Yeah. But the truth goes much deeper than those words, as we just mentioned. As we just read above in item number 26, let's review that again. Duane? The withdrawal of the divine countenance from the Savior in this hour of supreme <clears throat> anguish pierced his heart with a sorrow that can never be fully understood by man. So great was his agony that his physical pain was hardly felt. Wow. And I believe, <clears throat> I think we all agree that the marks on his hands and his feet will always be there. Mm -hmm. And that's what will kind of keep the balance. Yep. That no one will ever want this to happen again. His greatest pain was caused by the fact that he could not feel the presence of his fathers because of sin was separating him from his father. Do we, and this is my question for you, do we feel that pain when we sin and choose to separate from God? Most of us don't. Okay, do any of us do? I don't know if anyone does. <laughs> <laughs> wow. God did certain other things at the time of Christ's death so that the people would begin to realize that his was not just the death of an ordinary man. Great darkness covered the land for about three hours. The curtain hanging in the temple was torn in two from top to bottom. There was a great earthquake and rocks split apart. The graves of some of God's faithful people were from the past broken open. After Jesus rose from death, those faithful people from the past went into the city where many people saw them. You can read those details in Matthew 27, verses 45 and 51 to 52 and Mark 15, verse 38. So what was the worst thing that happened to Jesus Christ at the time of his crucifixion? He had already been beaten and scourged. He was wearing a crown of thorns. He was forced to try to carry his own cross, which he was unable to do when he fell. He was crucified with nails through his hands and feet. But Christ's greatest suffering was much more than that. The suffering of Christ was to demonstrate the full effects of sin. No one had ever died or ever has died that death since then. Seeing what happened to Christ, how can we continue to sin as if it were a minor matter? At times we may feel that we suffer because we are Christians, but how can our suffering be compared to the suffering of Christ? Look at some verses from the Bible on that question. Acts 14, 22, they strengthened the believers and encouraged them to remain true to the faith. We must pass through these many troubles to enter the kingdom of God, they taught Goodness Bible. Philippians 1.29, for you have been given the privilege to serving Christ, not only by believing in him, but also by suffering for him, <coughs> Goodness Bible. Second Timothy 3.12, 
everyone who wants to live a godly life in union with Christ Jesus will be persecuted. Will be, will be persecuted. persecuted. Good news Bible, yes. What a promise. Is that still tw true in 2022? Yes. Yes, yes. Christ our Lord has suffered more than any of us ever could. At the cross, he has borne our griefs and carried our sorrows. Isaiah 53, 4. What we know only as individuals, he suffered for us all corporal corporately. Directly. He also has sin, sinless. He who became, was sinless. He grew up sinless, but became sin for us, suffering in a way that we, as sinful creatures, couldn't begin to imagine. Adult Sabbath School Bible Study Guide. Isaiah 53, 4, but he endured the suffering and that should have been ours. The pain that we should have borne, all the while we thought that his suffering was punishment sent by God. Good news Bible. That's, but a, it that's an important passage right yes. there. Because people think it's, you're well off financially and your health is good, God's smiling on you. Yeah. And the flip side is you've got problems economically and your health, God is angry with you. And that's the oldest story we have in the Bible. Well, and think of all the people who believe that Jesus died on the cross because God's wrath was poured out on him. Well, we don't, don't explain that God wrath for Romans yeah, 1, 18, obviously. 24, 26, yeah. and 28. And to talk about 24, some of the stuff that's going on, and you get, get me inundated with, with the news now, yeah. some of these, these weirdos yeah. uh, that's being kind, uh, Romans 124. Yeah. And is God intervening? No, he's just letting natural results happen to people. So what is implied by that sentence? We thought that his suffering was punishment set by God. Romans 6.23, as we know, uh, says, sin pays its wage, death. 2 Corinthians 5.21, Christ was without sin, but for our sake God made him share our sin. In other words, he treated him as if he were a sinner. He, he, he wasn't a sinner. He treated him as if he were a sinner in order that in union with him we might share the righteousness of God. If we learn the lessons, then we can share the righteousness of God. And credible as it may seem, Christ was willing to go through all of that to save us. Jim? John 10, 28, Jesus said, I, have, I give them eternal life and they shall never die. No one can snatch them away from me, from the Good News Bible. Romans 6, 23, for sin pays its wage, death, but God's free gift is eternal life in union with Christ Jesus, our Lord, also from the Good News Bible. Titus 1, verse 2, which is based upon the hope for eternal life, God, who does not lie, promises, excuse me, promised us this life before the beginning of the of time. John, excuse me, first John 2, 25. And this is what Christ Himself promised to give us eternal life. And if we put to John 17, 3, eternal life is to know God. Yeah. And to know means to get involved with it yeah. and make it incorporated into your, your thinking. What was the real cause of Christ's suffering in those final hours of his life on this earth? That was Satan's final chance to try to get Jesus to give up his whole purpose of coming to this earth. It was not God's will that Jesus should be tortured and beaten and crowned with thorns. Those were all acts of Satan, or inspired by Satan anyway. What troubled Christ most of all was the fact that he could not feel his connection to the Father through that experience. He felt like his Father had abandoned him. And of course, we know, what did he, what did he say? My, my God, God, my God, God. Why hast thou forsaken me? Why hast thou forsaken me? That, of course, was not true. But God needed to demonstrate to the entire universe what the full consequences of sin are. Jesus is the only being so far who has died the second death, a death that results directly from sin. We can choose one, to live a life attempting to follow the pattern Jesus set for us and live forever, or two, live a life of selfishness following the pattern of Satan, and we will die the death that Jesus died, separated from God, the only source of life. 
Jesus had some idea of what was coming when he went to be baptized by John. He did not receive baptism because he was a sinner. Instead, he did it as an example for us. Receiving baptism is to be a recognition of the fact that we have set aside our sinful lives of the past, burying that life in the waters of baptism, and rising to a new life in Christ. Carrie? Jesus did not receive baptism as a confession of guilt on his own account. He identified himself with sinners, taking the steps that we are to take and doing the work that we must do. His life of suffering and patient endurance after his baptism was also an example to us. <coughs> Up coming out of the water, Jesus bowed in prayer on the river bank. A new and important era was opening before him. He was now upon a wider stage, entering on the conflict of his life. Though he was a prince of peace, his coming must be as the unsheathing of a sword. No one upon earth had understood him, and during his ministry he must still walk alone. As one with us, he must bear the burden of our guilt and woe. The sinless one must feel the shame of sin. Alone he must tread the path. Alone he must bear the burden. Upon him who had laid off his glory and accepted the weakness of humanity, the redemption of the world must rest. That's from Ellen White's Desire of Ages, page 111, 2 to 5. I hope you who are listening in won't, don't mind the fact that we've quoted so much from Ellen White in this particular lesson, but there's so many issues that she spells out so much better than any other source. Yeah. We just felt it was absolutely essential. Gordon? Romans 6, 3 and 4. For surely you know that when we were baptized into union with, with Christ Jesus, we were baptized into union with his death. By our baptism, then, we are buried with him and shared his death in order that just as Christ was raised from death by the glorious power of the Father, so also we might have, we might live a new life. And 2 Corinthians 5, 21, Christ was without sin, but for our sake, God made him share our sin in order that in union with him, we might share the righteousness of God. Good News Bible. Let me just mm, try to make a point very clear here. What we're saying here, Jesus, there's no way that sins could be picked up or put in a bucket somehow and poured out on Jesus. That's not possible. What, we, what happened there was that Jesus was treated as if he were a sinner. And the Father therefore separated his beams of light and love and glory from Jesus. And those are the only, for human beings, those are the only source of life. And so Jesus was dying there. When we are baptized, how many of us really understand that baptism means death to sin and it is only meaningful if we actually live a new life with less and less sin controlling us in the future? In his book, The Cross of Christ, by John R. W. Stott, who died in 2011, the famous Anglican theologian compared the death of Jesus to the death of Socrates. Socrates lived from 470 to 399 BC. He was condemned to death because he was encouraging the youth of Athens to reject the gods of the city. Socrates was forced to drink a cup of poisonous hemlock. Socrates took the cup and gladly drank it. And there's the this, this site there from Plato, Phaedo, and, and so forth. How does that death compare with the death of Jesus? Jesus, in imagination, held up the cup of suffering in the Garden of Gethsemane. He realized how serious that cup was, representing a total separation from his father, thus causing his death. It was so distressing to Jesus that he sweat great drops of blood. Scott concluded correctly that Jesus was pained drinking that cup of suffering, but it was not the physical pain that he was experiencing that was the issue. Ellen White made it very clear that the greatest suffering that Jesus experienced was caused by his separation from his father. That was worse than any or all of his physical suffering. That separation was what caused his death. And I know we've repeated that idea many times in this lesson, but uh, I think we just, we have to really nail it down. The death Socrates died was a death with which 
the world is familiar. Christian martyrs who died in the flames likely suffered more physical pain, but no one else had died the death that Jesus died. Uh, Duane? As he, Jesus, neared Gethsemane, he became strangely silent. He had often visited this spot for meditation and prayer, but never with a heart so full of sorrow as upon this night of his last agony. Throughout his life on earth, he had walked in the light of God's presence. When in conflict with men who were inspired by the very spirit of Satan, he could say, He that sent me is with me. The Father hath not left me alone, for I do always those things that please him. John 8, 29. But now he seemed to be shut out from the light of God's sustaining presence. Now he was numbered with the transgressors the guilt of fallen humanity he must bear. Upon him who knew, no, who knew no sin must be laid the iniquity of us all. So dreadful does sin appear to him, so great is the weight of guilt which he must bear, that he is tempted to fear it will shut him out forever from his father's love. Feeling how terrible is the wrath of God against transgression, he exclaims, My soul is exceeding sorrowful, even unto death. And again, Desire of Ages 685. So what have we learned from this lesson? I wish you all could feed us back what you've seen. But Jesus suffered more than any other human being has ever suffered. His suffering was not only the physical suffering that we know about, but also that suffering was exceeded to a great extent by the fact that he was experiencing excruciating pain because he felt that his father was withdrawing his beams of light and love and glory. He was being separated from his father by sin. As human beings, we cannot even comprehend what that means. Jesus went through that experience twice. We've already in this lesson seen he, he went through it in the Garden of Gethsemane, being separated from his father. Then he went through it again in Calvary. So the entire onlooking universe saw what happened in the Garden of Gethsemane. We didn't. But we did see what happened on Calvary, and I hope that we have learned from that the seriousness of sin. Let's pray. Our kind and loving Father, such a momentous lesson is to be learned from this experience. We're, we're told again by Ellen White that would be, it would be well to spend a thoughtful hour every day contemplation of the life of Christ, especially the closing scenes. And I think we have gotten just a taste of that in this lesson. We thank you for leading us through it. In Jesus' name, amen.